Thank you for your commitment and dedication in being here. Um, I'm so overjoyed to be here with Vanessa and Fahana this morning. Um, they are both absolute powerhouses and we're going to have a very important and timely conversation around climate justice just a few days away from COP26. Um, I just want to quickly say a huge thank you to The Conduit. I think they may have had a minor heart attack when we asked to do an event, just <laughs> given how active they are going to be at COP and um, how busy they are. So thank you guys. Uh, we are really, really grateful to be here. So um, we are here, of course, to celebrate Vanessa's new book, a Bigger Picture, My Fight to Bring a New African Voice to the Climate Crisis. Vanessa, for many of you, needs no introduction. She's a Ugandan climate activist and co-founder of Rise Up Movement. Um, Vanessa, you've been described as a rising star of the global climate movement, but I would say you have well and truly risen taking your rightful place at the center of the climate conversation. Um, welcome, Vanessa, to London. We're very, very happy to have you. Thank you. Bahana, um, your bio is so unbelievably long, I had to <laughs> shorten it a little bit to make it, but suffice to say, she's a very, very accomplished woman. You're an environmental lawyer, author, activist, expert advisor to climate, the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Over the past three decades, Fahana has worked on a number of international treaties, including the Paris Climate Agreement. She has represented small island nations threatened by the effects of global heating. We met during her time as political coordinator of Extinction Rebellion, where she played a key role in XR April 29 protests, 2000, 2019 protests, gluing herself to the Shell HQ offices in London, taking direct action alongside thousands of other activists. So, let's get into it. Vanessa, I want to come to you first. Um, for many of you, for many people, they may have become familiar with your work. Um, when you were famously cropped out of an image, but I want to go back a year earlier where you had very much started your activism. Tell me what, what drove you to start protesting. Thank you. Um, sorry. <coughs> Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just happy that all of you guys are here. I'm so honored. Um, uh, I started my activism in 2019. Uh, that, that was the first week of January. And prior to 2019, that was 2018, uh, I started to read about how uh, the people in my community were being challenged by certain issues. And at that point, I was surprised to find out how the climate crisis was impacting the lives of the people in my country, Uganda. And uh, I decided that I would do something about it. So uh, getting inspiration of the climate strikes mm -hmm. from Greta, I also started striking for climate every Friday in my country and uh, going to schools, uh, speaking to students, going to communities, speaking to people in communities and yeah that's how I started. Bahana, um, take me back to you in your early 20s already doing incredible climate work. You've dedicated your life to this issue. What drove you to first get involved and how has it felt the past couple of years to see the incredible momentum around this issue? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to the conduit, to all of you. And, you know, this um, platforming, giving voice, making visible activists from the Global South in particular wouldn't have happened and wasn't happening um, when I was 22, 24. So sometimes, you know, we should just reflect and pat ourselves a little bit on the back. I know there's so much more to do always, but this is a really big moment. Um, yeah, when I was 24, I, by chance, got an intern, a sort of internship with um, uh, an organization which trained lawyers to help and provide pro bono legal advice and assistance to the small island states. So that was 1991, you can work out your, my age uh, from there. And the climate negotiations were then had started and these group of lawyers were helping small island states which came together in this organization called the Alliance of Small Island States. It was set up by my colleagues who had started work then, so that's how I started. 
Um, and I want to say that, you know, that organisation, it was called the Foundation for International Environmental Law and Development, bit of a mouthful, uh, doesn't exist anymore. But the work that we started, you know, it lasted for about 20 years, is now everywhere. So sometimes you can seed things and they take, take uh, fruit and now every delegation in the climate negotiation has a lawyer for one probably probably you know we prevent as many things as possible but we also fight for visibility and voice and uh, a seat at the table for all those uh, countries who are very vulnerable uh, on the international stage so Vanessa after a few months around a year um, your activism is gaining traction and recognition and you're invited to Davos in 2020 what, what happened there yeah, in 2020, I received an invitation from the Arctic Base Camp uh, to go to Davos. And when I when I got there, the first thing I really noticed was how extremely cold it was, <laughs> and how unprepared I was. And my hands were really freezing, and everything I was touching was really hurting. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I managed to uh, get. Um, some help uh, with some really cool friends I met, uh, like Karam, uh, at the at Davos, and uh, I was with some other activists from different parts of the world, and we were just uh, sleeping out in these tents, and also uh, we went to a school in Davos uh, to speak to some students. It's it's like we were organizing from those tents, and I also got the opportunity to be at a press conference uh, with other activists. And, uh, it was a Friday, and I was, I was so excited uh, to be at the press <laughs> conference. And, well, it would be the second time I would speak yeah, at a press conference, but I was still happy because I knew that usually there are so many journalists mm -hmm. there, so it helps um, amplify uh, what I'm talking about or what other activists are talking about. So yeah, when I got there, I, you know, the, when you get in a place and you realize, like, you realize that you're the only person maybe on the stage or that looks like yourself, you, you suddenly feel like you don't, you don't want to just speak for what is happening in your country, but you also want to speak for what is happening um, across, let me say, different parts of Africa. So I remember at the press conference, some of the things that I really you know, talked about was the importance of listening to activists from different parts of the world and how that would help us um, in achieving climate justice because climate justice is not justice if uh, certain people are left out. And later on, I saw this article and picture by the AP, and the first time I saw it, I on Twitter, I thought that um, because the article was shared, so maybe the picture was <coughs> minimized. So I went to read the article, but when I went to the site um, of the article, it was the full picture, but I wasn't in the picture, and I wasn't included as one of the activists at the press conference, and also nothing that I had said had been like included. So that I was really surprised because I really emphasized how it was important to you know, listen to every activist. So I was so surprised. And at that moment, uh, the first thing that I wanted to do was to ask why I had been cropped out because I was sure that I had. And when I asked that question, I, I didn't expect so much support to really come in from people, and I didn't really know it would, uh, it would reach so many people. I was looking for an answer from AP, and it's later on that I see it being everywhere, and many people talking about it, and uh, that experience, I would say, it's marked a lot in my activism. Mm. So Associated Press crop you out of that image. There were four other white women in that image, I think. Three or four activists. Four. Four activists. Um, you post a video and you share a tweet, and I just read what you wrote. You didn't just erase a photo, you erased a continent, and later you would write, 
we are on the front line, Bill, but we are not on the front page. Can you tell me what you meant by that? Yeah, um, after making that tweet, um, I decided that I would, I was asking myself whether I should make a video. But then I was, at that point, I was so overwhelmed and really emotional. So I decided I would do it later when I feel much better. And unfortunately, when I did it again much later, um, I just found myself getting emotional again. So the, the words that I spoke were really coming from a very deep place in my heart because that is what I felt at that point. And it was beyond what I felt, it was the reality. I come from a continent that uh, is not responsible for the climate crisis. Historically, Africa is responsible for only 3% of global emissions, and yet Africans are already suffering some of the most severe impacts of climate change. But while Africans are experiencing all these disasters, the droughts, the cyclones, the floods, while the global south is on the front lines of the climate crisis. It is not on the front pages of the world's newspapers. No one is paying attention to the experiences of what people are going through in countries like mine. So that is what I mean. That image became such a powerful symbol um, for a global trend, a global issue that, as you say, the global south are disproportionately impacted, but so often excluded from the conversation. Well, Anna, there are parallels in your work. Um, you, from a legal perspective, um, as we've heard, you've represented small island nations. Tell us, what are we talking about here? What, what is climate justice? Um, well, it's literally putting people at the centre of our decision-making frameworks. Um, and that sounds really obvious, but it isn't obvious, because actually, you know, uh, our economic frameworks don't put people and don't put the planet at all centre stage, those are add-ons, you know, those are uh, things that uh, get factored in, um, but they are really very marginal, and it's really this unfairness to, to people and the planet, which is at the heart of the justice agenda, and that's what we're also working on right now for the COP, COP26, so that COP26 will centre fairness and justice and equity, these are all related words and different words, but they all mean the same thing, which is putting people, well-being, and nature at the centre of our decision-making, when in, that, in fact that's not been the case. So that's what we mean. And, you know, I, I just want to say how heartfelt and to say what enormous courage it must have taken you to, to react at that moment and to decide, decide to do something, and just in a parallel. So I'm, you know, I'm an advisor to this thing called the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is now a group of 48 countries and the origins of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, the CVF, is in 2009 when we had a massive conference called COP15 in Copenhagen that was supposed to agree a treaty uh, to follow up Kyoto. The, the, the countries, the vulnerable countries were invisible. So this group of advisors and these leaders said, we need to have a V7 like the G7 because they did not have any visibility on the international stage at the leaders' level. And so you, you're sort of shocked, but I'm reminding you that actually we took a step, we took an action to create a forum where the leaders of our countries would be visible on, in decision-making. We didn't call it the V7 in the end, we called it the CVF. So these, these things you know, take time and effort, imagination and courage, but they're really all part of the step of correcting a huge set of historic and systemic injustices, you know, mainly against the global south, mainly against black and brown people. And we're seeing that consequence. So if you're a country representing and mainly constituted by, um, you know, uh, colonialism and at the other end of it, you're still disadvantaged, you're still diminished, you're still not participating equally in the climate negotiations. So I'm, what I am encouraged by is actually that this battle, which is a really big long-term battle, is now being fought, you know, everywhere, um, including here at the Conduit and including by young people who are really taking that uh, challenge and really saying, let's dismantle this whole system. It is very toxic. 
I just want to dive even deeper. What do you, I think still there's a sort of sense that climate change is a kind of purely environmental or nature problem, but it is an issue of human rights. Why? Why is that? How would you explain that to somebody who doesn't understand why this is a social justice issue? Well, the origins of climate change do come from the scientific community. So it comes from science, and those scientists are immersed in, you know, and know environmental problems. And so when the climate treaty was being negotiated from 1989 onwards, we sort of saw this problem, and I, I admit, me too, uh, saw this problem as a sort of pollution problem, and that we could control it through our traditional, you know, environmental tools of a, a bit of regulation, but through, you know, education, information, you know, there was a huge shift to market-based mechanisms, carbon taxes, offsets, which were very cool at the time. But very much because, you know, industry um, said, we don't want to be regulated, we'll use all these other carbon, you know, mechanisms. And so it was sort of seen as an end of pipe, we'll just control this polluting bit. It wasn't seen as part and parcel of the entire economy. Um, and I guess, you know, it came from that scientific environmental realm and it's taken a, a long time for people to grapple with the fact that emissions are related to lifestyles, related to production, related to every single sector actually, whether it's energy, transport, fashion, agriculture, land use, our relationship with every single act of, uh, of being is related to, you know, emissions in some ways. Um, so we can't just control it by an end of pipeline technology, which is kind of what we did with the ozone layer, and we did that with sulfur dioxide. We did that, all these air problems. So slightly nerdy, but you know, you know, explanation for why this problem is still sitting with this original DNA, and that's why we need to change that DNA. We need to change the operating system, and we are changing it, by the way, but it's taking a massive effort, and now we know that actually it's the entire system that needs changing. It, there is no retrofit option here. It is actually the underlying system, and that has evolved over 400 years, and that's why you know, Glasgow is important in terms of the Paris sort of time cycle of annual summits and the five-year sort of ratchet provisions that we built in for increasing ambition. But it's also a 400-year reset that's needed, really, of, of a very exploitative, nature-depleting, system that was based on colonialism, that was based on imperialism, that was based on the idea that nature didn't matter except as a resource. Yep. We love nerdy. Nerdy too nerdy. <laughs> um, okay, very much linked to that then, Vanessa. I mean, this is literally a climate justice manifesto almost, a very, very powerful um, and ambitious vision for a climate just world. Why is it important to you to draw those links? I mean, I guess what Fahan is talking about is intersectionality. Why is it important to draw the links between the climate crisis and feminism? And what would you say to someone who said to you, what has racism got to do with the climate crisis? Yeah, um, usually I, I like to say that climate change is more than statistics, mm. and it's more than weather, it's about the people. It's, it doesn't just end on a report on how many you know, thousands have been affected. It goes beyond that. What happens to an individual? What happens to a family? What happens to a community uh, when these disasters occur? Usually, um, I say maybe the floods or the cyclones that we see, they could be like the primary impacts but no one ever cares to know what happens after what I usually call the secondary impacts, like to a family. Um, one of the most shocking things I got to learn about climate change in 2019 was how it was uh, exacerbating the rates of child births mm. um, through an article. And it was explaining how certain families, uh, when they lose uh, maybe their farms or their businesses, they are forced to, um, to give up some of their children for marriage, and those are the girls, because they expect bride rights, uh, especially in African countries. 
So I started to understand how climate change was in the end affecting girls going to school, was in the end affecting girls finishing school, and also leading many girls into forced marriages at a very young age. And uh, there are times when I've been told, why don't you speak up for poverty? But then I started to understand that climate change also exacerbates poverty in communities, which keeps families in poverty traps that are passed on from generation to generation. That when a family finally has maybe some food to sell, then it's destroyed by a flood and they go back to zero. So I started to understand that we can't eradicate poverty without climate justice. We can't have gender, uh, gender equality. No, we can't have climate justice without gender <coughs> equality. And I started to learn how um, conflicts or peace building in our communities is also affected by the climate crisis. As resources are continuously depleted, societies or communities are in battle, you know, for these depleted or scarce resources. It could be water, it could be food. So many sudden efforts in having peace in communities are also at risk because of the climate crisis. I also want to understand this pandemic and how it also connects to the climate crisis. Mm. And I can speak that, I can talk about that from the vaccination perspective. As um, you know, we were preparing for the COP, very many activists from the most affected areas that struggled you know, to travel to COP. And one of those reasons has been vaccine inequity. So now I start to understand that because of vaccine inequity, certain voices from the most affected areas want to be represented at the whole. So it starts to make sense that this is that we are in one system. And if anything in that system, it's like an interconnected system. If just one, one part is removed, then it all comes, eventually it all comes crumbling down. Some may be immediate impacts, some may be impacts that will come far later. If just one piece, if just one piece of a puzzle is missing, it can never be completed. So I think that life would be complete if the whole puzzle is fit. And that's how I would um, explain how climate change ends up affecting people's lives and it goes beyond statistics. And in the case of uh, climate justice, um, and ensuring that the people are at the heart of decisions, you know, many times you hear maybe corporations or governments talk about things like tree planting campaigns. But sometimes these campaigns mean grabbing of lands of certain communities, especially indigenous communities. So if your tree planting campaign means that a certain indigenous community is going to lose their land, that is not climate justice. Mm. If you're talking about electric vehicles, if uh, the manufacturing of those vehicles means exploitation of children, exploitation of girls or women who work in these places where whatever things are used to make those cars. If there is exploitation, if that is the cost of electric vehicles, then that is not climate justice. If climate finance means adding more debt to countries or communities that didn't cause the climate crisis. And governments showed that they are providing climate finance, but it's coming in form of guns. That is not climate justice. So it's, it has been a journey of learning how 
all these things are connected. And if just one piece doesn't fit, then it all comes crumbling down. You mentioned statistics, and I think we are very disconnected. I, I want to read something you tweeted just a couple of days ago. I want people to understand that a rise of 1.2 degrees Celsius is already hell for many people in Africa. And um, Fahana, you're widely credited for um, getting the 1.5 degree target, net zero by 2050, into the Paris Climate Agreement. Do you think that we are disconnected from the reality of these numbers, these statistics? Um, for people on the ground. And linked to that, um, Vanessa, I wonder if you could share what is happening in Uganda right now. So at Paris, we um, did achieve getting a reference. When I say we, this is over 120 countries that are smaller countries that in general together, you know, emit less than 5% of emissions, have billions of the world's population. So that was a huge effort. And that 1.5 uh, ceiling was put forward in 2009 at the COP15, which I just mentioned to you. So it took six years to get that um, from that point. The science has been clear that you know there were two degree um, goal that the EU, many others had been putting forward, was inadequate even back then. You know this is now 12 years ago. So it's taken a long time to normalise this as the, the standard of safety. And it isn't safe because the world today isn't safe, so many parts of the world. Um, and the net zero by 2050 goal was the translation of the then science of emissions, the carbon budget, into a global goal that would be tractable, accountable. And, and, and obviously it is having a massive impact. I know loads of people are you know, doubt it, but the fact that it's being greenwashed, abused, its definition being stretched is showing that it's efficacious, it is effective, it is pulling out and drawing out everyone to make commitments. It's a benchmark that everyone can understand in the nerdy world. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, out there we understand it. And then on this, on this issue of uh, the relationship between 1.5 and loss and damage, these were the two big asks that my ministers, my leaders of the countries I was supporting said were the priority and we achieved the inclusion of an article on loss and damage separated from adaptation. This is the big fight that you'll also have in COP26 is, you know, the richer countries want to say displacement, people losing homes, people ending up migrating is adaptation. I'm not kidding. That's what they're saying, in effect. And that's why the ministers and leaders of our country said, that's not adaptation. That is loss and damage. Someone loses their house and it ends up in a, in a shelter and are unable to go back. That is not adaptation. They've just lost, you know, they may have lost uh, family and friends. Actual deaths are happening. But that is not adaptation. And that's what the fight is about. You know, people want to say that that's that's just adaptation on your part. So millions and millions and millions of people will be affected in terms of their livelihoods. They will be suffering from harm that is irreparable, that completely changes their, their lives. That means that they have to uh, move, do things completely differently, and that, and that we're not able to recognize that. Uh, and that's the invisibility all over again. But somehow the efforts, the burdens that we bear in the global south, and I identify, you know, obviously I'm from Pakistan, it is just the same old thing. And this is the fight for justice that we're bringing to the COP to say loss and damage has to be f acknowledged that it's happening. And it has to be funded, no more blah, 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 uh, you know, funded. Because that's the reality for so many people uh, they don't need the code read. They don't need to read the IPCC report. They're already living in it. That's their lived experience. Right. Um, in my country, with the fights in the global temperatures, we are seeing more of changes in weather patterns. And this is causing more extreme rainfall in 
certain parts of the country, uh, extreme droughts in other parts of the country. So some of the major things that we've seen happening has been floods, uh, frequent floods in the western part of the country, areas of Kasese, and there's still people who are living in camps um, in bad living conditions after the experience of last year's floods and even this year there were more floods as well. Um, and in the eastern part of the country, areas of Mount Elgon, in Bibida, Bindujo, it's mainly floods and landslides as well. And when these things happen, it means destruction of people's homes, um, loss of lives, destruction of people's farms and uh, people's businesses. And last year, we had the rise in the water levels of Lake Victoria, uh, encroaching people's homes and forcing people to leave their homes at a time when, during the pandemic, at a time when people had to stay at home to keep themselves safe, uh, they were battling another crisis. So those are some of the things that we've seen and when, uh, when these floods uh, happen, especially the floods that are the most common, uh, many people's livelihoods are destroyed. Yeah. yeah, we've seen schools being submerged, we've seen hospitals being submerged as well because of the extreme rainfall. Uh, the climate crisis this year, I think more than any, has become completely impossible to ignore. It's been a year of converging crises, as you say, the pandemic the ongoing climate crisis and our own racial injustice. Um, it's very clear we live in broken systems. We've been talking about them, but I think the real issue here is that people don't believe that there is an alternative, that different systems can exist. Bahana, I know this is something you're very passionate about. Is something else possible? Um, can we design better systems and build a better, fairer and greener world? And should we spend more time focus on painting a vision for that world rather than painting a vision for a dystopia that we're all too good at doing? Just um, a small question. Yeah, yeah, just a small question. So, so I, think, I think it's our politicians that are not accepting that the system is broken and our politicians are, you know, deeply influenced and sometimes indirectly in the pockets of vested interests and powerful interests. So, you know, I glued myself to Shell because actually a nerdy report came out. <laughs> that was the final tipping point. You know, showing that the five big fossil fuel companies in the world had spent billions since the Paris Agreement. So the rebellion was in 2019. They spent billions, so not, you know, on lobbying, marketing, uh, changing narratives, telling you they were doing something green. And I, there was something that inside me snapped. It was like, I, I can't take this anymore. I can't write another report. I've written loads. I'm going to take my body and you know, glue it. And, and that's, I'm saying that because it's the politicians and our decision-making systems that are now completely captured and there are skirmishes about how far they can go, and you're seeing that so visibly for this COP. I think ordinary people know the system is broken. They knew that before COVID came along, and COVID has totally broke, you know, broken the bounds of possibilities. Governments, in effect, had to nationalise, take on enormous you know, debts, you know, pay citizens to stay at home. So I think we are already at that point where the system has collapsed. You're living in the collapse. And it's time to spend as much energy as possible on searching, experimenting, pioneering and honouring all those who've been living very different lifestyles and values and creating alternatives. It's time to sit and learn from, say, indigenous communities, local communities, farmers, agroecology, permaculture. You know, I think that economy is already there, but it doesn't get as much airtime and space and we ourselves, including myself, you know, are sort of fixated a bit with what there is as opposed to what there could be and is sitting underneath. So we, we do need to share those stories and have the courage to accept that we can live in a different world 
and that world is already here. Um, you know, I think Aaron Dutty Roy said, you know, another world is possible on the quiet day I can hear her breathing. Well, she said that in 2003, and it's here. So, so live in that world, make a choice to live in that world, and uh, do all the things that are necessary to, to, to accept that, accept that and announce and celebrate the death of capitalism, which is what I think we're going to do in, in Glasgow, right? We're going to announce it dead. <laughs> Um, I should have said at the start that we are going to do uh, 10 to 15 minutes of questions and we would be yeah, yeah, very soon, so start thinking about them. Um, I love that you glued yourself to Shell because as someone who writes the law, opposes the law, and then breaks the law, it's just really great. Um, we, I want to come on to COP and Vanessa, your demands. Um, one of the chapters in your book is COP Out, and I want to ask you. Is a COP without justice at the centre, and is a COP without putting the voices of those disproportionately impacted at the centre a COP out? Yeah, it's um, <laughs> a COP out. Is, like, why does it exist if um, the people at the front lines are not amplified on the platform or not even listened to? And you, uh, Bahana, I just want to come back to your campaign, Justice Reset. Um, you have been since 1991 to every COP, or many, many <laughs> climate conferences, uh, which not only pays tribute to your relentless commitment to this issue, but also gives you an insight. How do we make this happen? How do we make sure that next week we have a COP with justice at the centre? Uh, yeah, I've been to 24, and this, uh, um, yeah, it's a lot of cops, isn't it? Uh, and I still think that, that we can achieve a lot more by demanding more and being insistent and supporting each other uh, to do that. So I think uh, with all of your support, um, you know, support Vanessa's demands for climate justice to be at the centre. And actually, it is in the end a bit nerdy. You do have to draft text and submit it and get parties to support it and get the presidency to take action and say, we want, this is what we want. And we have done that consistently. Um, you know, at Paris, the local communities and indigenous platform was established. That's a huge achievement, actually, for the indigenous people who fought for that. And you can, I think it's still too weak and it needs to go much, much further. We have a gender program. And now, actually, we need to complete... Uh, some of the governance which is too weak and all this patchwork of policies by saying actually you know it's not just about one committee or one policy here and there it is the whole system and that's what we're going to demand and see how far we get you know by week two. <laughs> okay time so for questions. I have a question about, we just touched on it um, at the end here, about the political process. I'm from South Africa, and in South Africa, the political system is in a pretty dire situation right now in terms of how the country can move forward. And I'd say pretty low on the agenda is something like climate issues, and on top of that, of course, climate justice. How are we to expect, or how can we better incentivize or make us or promote politicians of the global south to you know help us in this fight again for help us in this fight for climate justice if the politicians of the global north are not you know to a, a sufficient degree even doing that Thanks. well it doesn't help uh, in effect that the global north has acted in such a tardy way and in such a hypocritical way and that you know, is evident by the expansion of fossil fuels, the continued, um, you know, by, by very rich and leading countries like the UK, like Norway. Um, but I think in the end, it comes down to the vision of the world that we want and understanding the benefits of moving to a cleaner, more compassionate, more nature respecting societies ourselves for our own people. And now that essentially renewable energies we know also from uh, our architects and city and urban design planners that actually we can, we can really reduce energy demand and we can meet that demand through renewables cheaply, which are much cheaper. It's in our self-interest not to wait for the global north. 
And in fact, I think it's a coming of age for our own societies to not keep following a toxic pathway. That is not the pathway. And I think many of those leaders now are, I wish they were um, around during the, the struggles of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s when those leaders rejected essentially the pathway and tried to do something. I think it's very much the politicians that have grown up in the 80s and the 90s who are still wedded to essentially following whatever the West does, whatever the global North does. So I think a lot of this comes from movement building in the, in the global South itself. Uh, and finally, just, you know, what am I doing? Well, I'm trying to work at the moment with the global philanthropy, which has mainly funded, you know, uh, organizations and movements in the global North, because they've also thought that the global North will fix it, right? But that's not the case. So we're we have to shift and support and value our own agency, our own movements, our own leaders, our future you know, prime ministers and presidents uh, <laughs> to make the right decisions and to understand that the case for climate justice, for climate action is overwhelmingly for our own people. We don't have to wait for the Global North to act because they're not going to. And if Glasgow does anything, it will show how little faith we should have in the Global North putting our interests first. Yeah. You had it here first, Vanessa, for president. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, the next Davos you should go as president. Yeah, exactly. you go. <laughs> uh, you've got a mic there. Hi, I'm Grace. I'm um, from Australia, so an uh, exceedingly embarrassing country, but I'm <laughs> climate change. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think everyday citizens in Australia, Indigenous leaders, there are so many activists who do not feel represented, who feel crushed by our governments. And I think, to your point on the global north not leading, the global north is set to lose a lot from this shift because we benefit so greatly from exploitation and my question is around intersectionality. I am from a human rights organisation called War Free, we're focused on the eradication of modern slavery and I find it so difficult within the space of movements and of course within political rhetoric that we take bits, as you say, from different movements. We don't talk about climate change exacerbating forced and child marriage, we don't talk about the pandemic increasing forced and child marriage, we don't talk about the fact the same sectors take fashion that are destroying the earth, are destroying people's lives, and not just random people, young women of colour, that we then all benefit from. You know, H&M is 10 metres away, and it's right here with us. It's as close as the coffee we drink, the shirts on our back. So how do we push this intersectionality within the movements and within the political spheres? Because I feel like as long as leaders in every setting feel like they can take one club from the pack, choose that one, we're going to lose and we're going to fail the people that get failed every time. You get everyone to read Vanessa's book. <laughs> yeah. Vanessa, how do we how do we make sure intersectionality is at the centre of everything? I think through education. I think that um, there are places where you need to unlearn and then there are places where you need to relearn and then there are places where you need to learn new things. So I think that education in the movements or organizations <coughs> that uh, we work with is really important. And uh, the, the sudden uh, activists who talk about uh, these kinds of intersections, so it's important to maybe platform them or amplify their voices. Because there are times when um, maybe I've, say, I've spoken about educating girls for climate. And uh, people don't understand that uh, education of girls will eventually uh, reduce greenhouse gases. But uh, after maybe giving a talk about it, yeah, you see comments like, I didn't know something like this. And so I think education is really important and uh, uh, amplifying those who are talking about these things. I can say that uh, I've really learned from you uh, when it comes to climate and modern slavery and I think you're really educating so many people. Thank you. On that note, Vanessa, is there anyone that you would want everyone in this room to follow once leaving this room, follow their work? Does anyone come to mind who's most inspired you? I know you mentioned, of course, the late Magari, Matai, um, but who do you recommend people to follow? I really put you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> 
there, there's so many people, but I think I uh, would say make an effort mm -hmm. to look out for activists from the global south who are really doing amazing work on the ground. And you can follow them, you can share what they're doing, you can amplify them, you can support them with whatever resources you have. I think that would be really helpful. Awesome. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Lisa from South Africa. Um, so first of all, it's really fantastic to have like some African voices here in London. Um, so my question is a bit on the fact about how with the problem with Africa is that often it's crisis upon crisis upon crisis. So I know um, at the beginning of 2020, South Africa had a lot of traction with the climate movement, as did much of the rest of the world. And it was very, very inspiring to kind of see um, how much visibility it was all getting. Um, but then unfortunately, we got hit by gender-based violence protests, um, well, the good protests, but <laughs> bad bad thing to protest for, but so it just felt like it was that, and then it was hit by COVID, and then there, we just constantly have protests upon protests. And it's really difficult to kind of keep our accountability to the government because we have a lot of visibility, and then we kind of get hit by the next thing, and then no one really follows up on what happened uh, to the last thing that we protested about. Um, so my question, I guess, is um, probably to Vanessa about like, because you do a lot of work in schools, um, how do you suggest that the youth show their voice in a way that isn't um, only in the protest. So when, when those keep getting passed on by something else, how do they sustain the momentum uh, when a new issue has come up and when they can't necessarily get involved in high-level policy? Are there other ways to kind of keep the conversation going? Yeah, there are, I think there are quite a number of ways. Uh, many times people think that activism, the only way of doing activism is going to the street and protest. But I think that activism really comes so it really comes in a number of different ways. There are people who can not go to the street because of their the the the, the rules in their countries. Uh, maybe they can't get permits. We've also experienced that. So it's important. There are times I've been asked um, why I call my strikes climate strikes, and yet I'm not skipping school. And I think it's really crazy for, uh, for people to think that activism only means, when it comes to climate activism, it only means that you're skipping school. But uh, not everyone is skipping school, you know, to do the climate strikes every Friday. Yeah, so I think activism really comes in a number of ways. And it could be going to the streets, it could be signing a petition, it could be uh, starting a petition, it could be, um, writing to your local leaders uh, in your community. It could be supporting other activists as well. I know that there are times when uh, it feels like uh, people are now uh, maybe protesting for climate justice, and then another group comes and maybe is protesting for gender equality, like you say. I think it's important for movements to know that um, in the end, it's one big fight, yeah? I think it's important to know that in the end, it's one big fight, that if you're fighting for gender equality, we will be there for you because we know that uh, it's also affected by climate issues. So it would be good for movements to have uh, that kind of you know, education to understand that in the end, it's one big fight and one, you know, one kind of future that we are all hoping for. But otherwise, there are quite a number of ways that we can all do activism. You don't have to go to the streets if you don't want to. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think my, my, I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. I would say everyone has to add the word activist to their CVs, to what they do. Everyone. We don't need lots and lots of full-time activists if everyone does what I'm suggesting, which because everybody in every sector, every country is an emitter and is also a solution provider, everyone. And that's the only way in which we will deal with what we have to deal with. Uh, so it's about whether you're a shopkeeper, you're a farmer, you're a hairdresser, you're you know, a bread maker, whatever you are, if you're a lobbyist, if you're in marketing, if you're an accountant, if you're a lawyer, add the word activist and see what this moment calls on you. Uh, and there was a fantastic talk, let me just finish. You know, 
So lawyers, accountants, active, uh, 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 you know, marketing, all these finance industry, which is where the wealth of this country now comes from, our GDP in this country is in the services sector. We're responsible for loads of emissions because our, our professions prop up business as usual. We're the ones signing off as lawyers on those reports that in hidden ways contain bribes, corruption, campaigns, all that material. We've got to speak up. We're the ones, if you're in the marketing and ad agencies, supporting an essentially a consumption-based lifestyle. We've got to all stand up, as I said, add an activist thinking to your jobs already. That's a much better way, including in the global south, um, to, to, to make good on what we need to do. I think that's a very powerful note to end on. We have a huge responsibility to take action. And that's all our activists. Thank you so much, Professor Rahman, for being here. Thank you guys so much for coming.